Thank you for tuning in to a sermon from Redemption Hill Church. I'm so glad that you've joined us. It's our prayer that this will lift your heart and encourage you, set your eyes more fully on Jesus as we open God's word together. You can join us anytime in person or online in our live stream. You can find that at redemptionhilldc.org. If you're not in D.C., we encourage you to get involved in a local church where you live for the sake of encouragement and accountability in a local body, but we're also glad to have you join us and, and walk through this study with us. If you'd like to support the Ministries of Redemption Hill, you can do so at our website, again, redemptionhilldc.org. Father, I am thankful for your kindness to us, and I'm thankful that um, we can be together. And I'm thankful that it's warm this Sunday. We pray today that you would help us to, to be able to see what you have for us, to see um, your word and for our hearts to be moved. We do pray that, that you would help us to not just take this as an intellectual exercise, but that you would truly help us to have an encounter with the living and active word of God. And so as we pray, as we open your word, as we sing to you today, would you form our hearts, we pray, in Christ's name, amen, amen. Well, we are in a series that we just started in the book of Ecclesiastes. If you have a Bible, you can open it with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Um, we handed out journaling Bibles last week, little one book journaling Bibles for the book of Ecclesiastes. We should have more by next Sunday because we ran out, which is a fantastic problem. Uh, so that means a bunch of people took them. All right, so that we are going to continue, though, today in that series. And today, as we continue, the, we, we started last week by seeing being introduced to this guy, Kohelet, this preacher, this teacher. Somebody that is at least very much like Solomon, if it's not Solomon himself. And so we're getting an assessment of his wisdom. And saw last week that it begins, the book of Ecclesiastes starts by looking at all that we can learn, all that we can gain in life under the sun. And that's a really important aspect of understanding how we can read chapters 1 and 2. I know that in our community group this past week, as we talked about chapter 1, we got one of the questions we asked was, do you believe what chapter 1 has to say? And so I think initially people were like, well, yeah, because that's what you're supposed to say. It's in the Bible. But then it was like, well, wait a second. I don't know if I do believe what it had to say. Am I allowed to say that? Well, again, it's under the sun that this perspective is coming. That distinction is really important. We're going to talk about that a little bit as we go today. But today as we start, we're also going to talk about, um, today really gets into the desires of our hearts which is a major issue for us, something that every one of us deals with. Um, in 1950, the movie, the, the animated movie Cinderella was released by, by Walt Disney. Do you remember one of, the, one of the key songs in that movie that, even, I mean, it's, it's old, but it just seems enduring. This like captures the essence of Disney, is a dream is a wish your heart makes when you're fast asleep. In dreams, you will lose your heartache. Whatever you wish for, you keep. Have faith in your dreams, and someday your rainbow will come smiling through. No matter how your heart is grieving, if you keep believing, the dream that you wish will come true. That is the essence of what Disney has to say. I know that generations of little girls have been captured by that, and I know that because I'm surrounded by them. I have a mom and a sister and wife and two daughters that... Are, I know that these young girls, they were waiting for Prince Charming to sweep them off their feet, and then Alyssa got me. <laughs> but the message is clear. Follow your heart. There's nothing more noble and true. And so Ecclesiastes raises for us the question today, what does it look like for someone with unlimited resources, with great wisdom, with great initiative and opportunity, with no discernible barriers to follow their heart? Because for every one of us, we have barriers. Most of us are not independently wealthy to the point that we can just do whatever we want to do. So there's an immediate limiting factor on us. And the, the initiative not to not be lazy, but actually have the work ethic to do things and the opportunities to do things. So the, this is the foundation of the passage we will look at today in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, is to look at every pursuit under the sun. What are the things that we can throw ourselves into 
as we follow our hearts. So we read this. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart to, uh, how to cheer my body with wine and my heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few years of their, few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them all, in all kinds of fruit trees. I, plant, I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. And I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I, also, I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I, had also, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem, and my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep them from. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. And then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended doing it. And behold, it was all, it was vanity and a striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And so I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more to gain in wisdom than folly, as there is more to gain in light than darkness. The wise person has eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. And then I said in my heart, what, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart, that also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been for long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool, so I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me. All is vanity and a striving after the wind. I hated all my toil, in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise or a fool, Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is, is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who please, it pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so here you have somebody that says, I dreamed up everything I could for myself, anything that my heart desires. And you hear that repeatedly through, right? I said in my heart, this is what I'm going to pursue. I kept from my heart no pleasure. And in my heart, I found pleasure in my toil. And so he, over and over again, he returns to this. And there's a major theme of our passage in this chapter that nothing was held back. And so he talks about the desires of his heart, and he talks about the wisdom of his mind and the work of his hands, those three categories of life that he has pursued, everything that he can pursue. And so he begins, we're going to walk through those three. First, he pursued the desires of the heart. And did you hear what he came, up, came to? He said, pleasure itself is empty. Remember that, that word vapor, or, I mean the word, the word um, vanity is, is like, the, the connotation there is like steam or like a vapor, something that you can't grasp at. 
And so right now, if you go outside and breathe, you'll be able to see your breath. That If you're trying to grasp that or hope it sticks around, that's, what he, that's the kind of language, the connotation when you hear the word vanity in Ecclesiastes. Or if you watched any of the NFL playoff games yesterday, I was amazed watching in Kansas City because it looked like playoff football. When you see both lines lined up and everybody's breath is just like this mist, it was amazing. You all wanted that commentary on the NFL, I know. <laughs> um, I have to watch something because my team didn't make it and we're already talking about the draft. It's all vanity, striving after the wind. <laughs> so he begins by looking at the desires of the heart. He says, pleasure is meaningless, laughter is meaningless. These are things that we want, that we pursue. And we hear that, it's hard because when we hear that, we have to, again, we have to object a little bit. Like something in us says, no, that's not meaningless. Like laughter is the best medicine, right? Like having joy is actually makes a difference. Even physiologically, it makes a difference. And so what do you mean pleasure is meaningless and laughter is meaningless? If there's something we want to pursue in our lives, it's that. I want to have fun. I want to enjoy my life. I want to be around people that I enjoy and that I have fun with. And so here, it's important again to see that what we so often do in our own hearts is we take good things, because laughter isn't evil. Pleasure isn't evil. He talks about he gave his heart to drink wine. We have other places in Scripture that say, say that God gave us wine to gladden our hearts. And so these aren't evil things, but what, it, what happens is that we take good things, the things that God gives us in our lives, and we lift those things up to be the ultimate pursuit of our lives, and they will come up empty every time. And so pleasure isn't wrong, but it is empty if that is your end goal. Laughter is a good thing. It's good to laugh. But if that's your end goal, he says, it's madness. And we know this, that some of the people that are the most funny and laugh the most are also some of the most depressed. Fine drink is meaningless. He goes on, accomplishments are meaningless. He says, look at all the things I did. So I decided to give my heart to the work of my hands, and I, I became great. And so I made works, I built things, I planted vineyards, I had fruit trees and gardens, and I had servants to serve me, and possessions and herds and flocks more than anybody else. He got rich had tons of money, lots of concubines to the light of the sons of man. So he turned to sex, another thing that is a good gift of God, but when lifted up to be the ultimate, comes up empty. This is part of what makes it seem an awful lot like Solomon, because if you follow David and Solomon's lives in Scripture, Solomon had, had about a thousand women between wives and concubines. It was not good in God's eyes, but it shows that he did pursue that desire to its end point. He was also famous. He was well known. And still that was meaningless, a vapor, a chasing after the wind. And so this, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines in 1 Kings 11, 3. I actually put that in my notes. <laughs> so the more people lift up the thing the more the things that we lift up the good things we lift up is we make them the ultimate things the ultimate pursuits of our lives then we will as they come up empty we will become angry at them and this happens with people all the time so maybe this is an, an easier way to understand this because again i don't think most of us have gotten to a point in our lives where we could say i have pursued pleasure to the absolute end of all that pleasure can be and it's come up totally meaningless. But when we lift up good things to be the ultimate things, and, and, then, and they come up empty, we do get angry. And this does happen in relationships, where there will be people, you know, have you ever heard the expression, like, don't meet your heroes? Because the bubble bursts. You realize that somebody's just human, and maybe they're a jerk. Maybe they're not actually somebody that you would enjoy being around. And so we, but there's this problem that when we meet people or in our relationships in our lives, even if it's not somebody famous, but just it could be parents or children or spouses or friends, that when there are times when we will lift up people in our lives as being something great that we need to pursue. And the more that we idolize people, the more that we will demonize them when they come up empty and fail us in the end. 
That's something we have to be careful about. With, he talks about his fame here, his, that he was revered and that he was respected. And, and there, we have to be careful there that the more people lift you up, always be cautious because the more that you'll be forced to either buy into the delusions of your own greatness or cover up the, and cover up the reality of who you really are or let them down and you'll be demonized. But Kohelet shows us, you, you may receive everything your heart desires, and you can pursue everything that you actually want, but if you do, then you will see that it will come up empty every time, because our lives, our hearts, are reaching and grasping for something transcendent. And, they, and we cannot be satisfied for things that are passing away. We get so fixated on ourselves and our own desires, too, that, that it, leads, it can't lead to having grasp of anything beyond our immediate concerns. And so, actually, if we are pursuing our own pleasure as the end of all things, then what we've done is we've actually idolized the desires of our own hearts, which is why, when they come up empty, we can become angry at life itself, feeling like God has betrayed us. G.K. Chesterton said, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaningless comes from being weary of pleasure. More recently, maybe you've heard this, Steve Jobs captured the American psyche here when he had the comeback story of the self-made man. He, was the, he made a juggernaut out of the company he was fired from in Apple, which everything on this platform except my Bible right now is made by Apple. He was an entrepreneur that seemed to not only understand the American consumer, but he seemed to tell the consumer what they want. This is what drives us nuts when it's like, I'm not going to have, Apple's like, you're not going to have USB ports anymore. And you're like, what? You have to buy all these extra ports now. It's what you want. In 2005, in a commencement address to Stanford University, Steve Jobs said, among other things, he said, your time is limited. So don't waste it living somebody else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions draw out, drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become, and everything else is secondary. Well, that's exactly what we want to hear. That's why Kohelet's message in Ecclesiastes 2 feels so bad. Because Steve Jobs is capturing exactly what, to, what we want to hear. This is a place where also Jobs went on to say, if, if you follow your heart, you will never work a day in your life. That's ridiculous. We see here that following your heart often means that you pour yourself into things that you're working for. And we forget that whether you're talking about the whimsical Walt Disney with birds that are dressing the to-be princess and mice that are sewing her clothes, or the entrepreneurial Steve Jobs, that both of these men were in the business of selling products. They were both masters of grabbing a hold of human desires and bringing them to their fullest. They knew that at our core, we are all insatiably self-focused. Of course, our primary desire is to pursue the dreams of our own hearts. Our hearts, we believe, will never do us wrong. It's partly true because our heart will always act with our interests in mind, and it's the only source we can count on to lead us to our deepest desires. So there's truth there, however wise or foolish those desires might be. But, but we honestly believe, every one of us, that our intentions are nearly always good. This is why when we hurt people, it can be hard to just apologize and say, I am so sorry that I hurt you. Because what do you want to do? What I meant to say isn't what you heard. If you just understood what I'm really thinking, what I'm really feeling, and the way that I'm looking at you, then you wouldn't be hurt. Because we really believe that our intentions are always good, that we always have the best of intentions, which, which is not always true. It's true that we are often working in our own interest, but, but having this idea that the deepest truth and reality of the cosmos is found by looking within us is one of the biggest lies that we are being sold every single day. There is no other storyline in movies right now. It's exhausting. 
The bravest thing you can do is self-discovery. A few years ago, I was rocked a little bit by Anthony Bourdain's death. You remember him? He was a, I guess he was a chef at some point. He made his living mostly not being a chef, um, writing about kitchens in his initial book, Kitchen Confidential, and then he became like a TV personality, traveling all over the place, experiencing different cultures, the show No Reservations that he kind of got started with, where he'd go and see like real life and real people and not just the tourist magazine spots in different places and try all kinds of food. I mean, I've watched his life and career and thought, man, that is the desire of my heart. I would love that. I think I could crush that. I just get to go hang out with people and eat and drink and enjoy different places. This sounds amazing. So it was devastating when Anthony Bourdain was found dead in a hotel room. He committed suicide. He struggled in and out with depression throughout much of his adult life, but, but it shows us we see this over and over again. He's not a unique case. That when people are given every desire of their hearts, it comes up empty. There's got to be something more. All right, the second pursuit is the wisdom of the mind. So verses 12 to 17, Kohala turns to that and says, all right, so I turn to wisdom because wisdom is good, right? Like wisdom is like light. Fools live in darkness, but, but the wise people are the, like those who have eyes in their head and and the foolish people are like people walking in darkness. We know it's better to have light than darkness. And, and so I pursued those things. And yet I perceived the same event happens to all of them. What happens to the fool will happen to me. And I said in my heart, this is vanity. It's a vapor. For if the wise, as of the fool, there's no enduring remembrance, seeing that the days to come will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated Life, because of what is, do- what is done under the sun, is grievous to me. It's all vanity, a mist, a vapor, a striving after the wind. And so this, is, uh, this can be a, a, one of the pursuits of our heart. We can decide, all right, I'm, I know that I'm not supposed to pursue those things, and so I shouldn't just pursue as much sex as I can have, and I shouldn't just pursue selfish gain. So I'm going to be wise. I'm going to be somebody that others can look to for advice and input and wisdom and, and to share and speak into their lives. And I want to be someone who, who is, it walks through this life wisely. I don't want to use all my money for frivolous things. I want to be wise with my money and use it rightly and steward it well. I want to be wise in my relationships. And, and so we can pursue that. And still what Kohel shows us is it doesn't matter in the end. You both die. Again, something we see all around us. Um, I had, uh, I have two grandpas, or had two grandpas. And my two grandpas lived in, some, in many ways very similar, had some very similar characteristics, and in many ways couldn't have been more opposite. Both of their funerals have had a major impact in my life, though at totally different times of life. One grandpa, both grandpas had large families with lots of kids, so I have lots of aunts and uncles and lots of cousins. Both of them worked hard. They had a high work ethic. So like Koheleth, they could say, they gave themselves to their toil. Both made mistakes and had their own selfish hang-ups. And both died in the end. One of my grandpas was abusive and an alcoholic. He left deep scars on his family that continued to cause problems in, in the life of, uh, continued to cause problems in the life of his wife, my grandma, and kids and grandkids. You know, one of, I have memories of that grandpa, but he, he killed himself, committed suicide on the week of my 10th birthday, five days before. So my 10th birthday was spent then at his funeral a couple weeks later. And I remember watching my dad wrestle through the difficulty of the good and bad of his own dad's life at the funeral. And since then, which was 33 years ago, the greatest comfort in his death was the end of misery for a life that was in shambles. My other grandpa was an ambitious entrepreneur. He was self-made and successful, a businessman and a family man. He... He had a house in the Florida Keys that he built, and so I can remember as a kid, we'd go down there and be able to go out on the reef and snorkel and fish, and, and, and at the end of his life, he was 
crippled by deteriorating health and repeated strokes. He had nine strokes by the time he died. He had been in a car accident and broke his neck and had shunts and different brain pressure things. I mean, he was in diabetes and lost a leg. Like, health went downhill hard. But he was somebody that was gathered around and had his family gathered around him throughout his life and was, was always one that was care, cared deeply about and would, like, would remember what's going on in your life and be worried about you. So he'd call me worried about what was going on with my car and whether my tires were good. And I'm like a freshman in college going, Grandpa, they're fine. He was my first funeral as a pastor. The first funeral I ever officiated. But I had to wrestle through the difficulty of preaching at my grandfather's funeral with no confidence that he had ever embraced Jesus. Despite the fact that we talked to him in innumerable times. And so who knows? You never know if on his last stroke as he was dying, he finally said, you know what, I'm going to give in and call Jesus my Lord and Savior and be the worker in the vineyard that comes at the 11th hour, but I have no confidence of where his eternity lies. So listen, in many ways, my grandfathers were similar, and in many ways, their lives couldn't have looked different. But it shows what Koheleth is talking about here. Their end led to the same place. Both paths lead to death. Both paths lead you to being forgotten. Not, maybe not in one generation, but most of us will be forgotten within three generations. If there's nothing beyond this life under the sun, if this really is all that there is, then you can't help but see the truth in what Koheleth has to say, whether we like it or not. When living comes up empty and we realize this is just a vapor, we're talking about a matter of a few years here. Was it really worth wise living or foolish living? Does it really make a difference? It's chasing after the wind. Okay, so then he turns third to the work of our hands. He says, I hated all my toil, which I I toil under the sun. Why? Because somebody's going to come after me, and they didn't earn it, and they might be a fool. All my work is just building an inheritance for somebody else, and I don't know what they're going to do with it. And work is hard. What do we have from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? All his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. Any of you feeling that this week about your job? Work is a vexation and a sorrow, and even at night, I cannot rest. Now again, biblically, we know work is a good thing. Scripture is clear that God designed work and designed us to work and that designed us to join him in forming and filling and cultivating his creation. The problem is when work takes over our lives and becomes an identity, and that's when you can feel like the worst thing somebody could say about you is that you're lazy, that you're not good at your job, that you're not employable. When you get into a job review and they just shred you to pieces, or maybe it's not even a job, a job interview, or maybe it's not a, 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 an annual review. Maybe it's just a boss that does that regularly. And so his statements are sobering here, right? Our, benefact, our benefactors, when we die, whatever you work your entire life to build up, whatever legacy you intend to leave, might be left to idiots. We want to believe our kids will be wise, or if you don't have kids, that you, you'd leave your wealth to someone who will handle it as carefully and wisely as you do, but... But that can't be guaranteed. Our work builds this inheritance, but, but here, for what? What are we building toward? Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 12, about a man who had so much grain come in that he filled his barns and didn't have a place to put the extra grain. And so what did he do? He took all the extra money and built bigger barns so that he could store more grain. And Jesus held that up as a contrast for for wise use versus foolish use of money, that everything in this world will tell you that the wise use of your money is to accumulate it and store it and find good ways to invest it to make it more at every possible turn and for at whatever cost. Wisdom of God says, what are you storing it for? Well, that's right. Okay, then you're going to die. And that's what God says in Luke 12 is, you fool, this very night your, your life is demanded of you. 
And so Kahala here is actually reflecting what Jesus taught, saying, okay, go ahead. Build bigger barns, bigger IRAs and 401ks. Accumulate wealth for yourself, and then you can sit back and find your security and comfort in your own prosperity and say, this is it. Now I can eat and drink and be merry, and death will come to every one of us. And all of that will belong to somebody else. And work is hard. It gives us our greatest anguish, especially if it's your identity. And this might strike closer here in D.C. than most places. We are a work-obsessed city. That's why when you meet somebody, that is the first question. Oh, your name is Joe. What do you do? Not just as a curiosity. Like, that doesn't actually get, happen everywhere. If you've been in D.C. a while, you need to go some other place and, and see how little that co- question comes up. But it, we, we start because it's the key that we are using that unlocks whether or not relationships are worth investment. And it can be hard. It keeps us up at night when it becomes our ultimate. And if work is our end goal, then your life will come up shapeless and empty of vapor, a chasing after the wind, and you'll end up like Kohel at the, at the end saying, I hate my life. And it's been said often, but nobody gets to the end of their life and on their deathbed says, you know what I wish I would have done? If I could go back and do this all again, is I wish I would have spent more time in the office. I wish I would have spent later nights alone punching keys on that computer. I wish I could have given more time to this organization or this company or this, this politician in this office and to this work that as soon as I leave, I'm replaced anyway. Our work is a vapor. It's a striving after the wind. So where do we go from here? Well, this Koheleth, this teacher, actually closes section one. There's four sections in Ecclesiastes, and section one comes to a close today. So thank God it only took two sermons. Because he says in verses 24 to 26, let's revisit those. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in all his, in his toil. Saying, this is a good thing. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For who, apart can, from him, can eat or who can have enjoyment? For the one, to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give it to one who pleases God. This also is a vanity and a striving after the wind. So the whole conclusion of these first two chapters is everything we can pursue under the sun comes up empty. It's all a vapor that we can't actually hold on to. It's God who gives wisdom, it's God who gives knowledge, and it's God who gives joy. But you can hear the frustration here of Koheleth that he he's, has this exasperation. He can't figure out how some people seem to be happy, how, some people seem to have joy, but other people are just miserable. And he says God must be the one that gives them satisfaction in the simple things of life, but it all feels arbitrary. You hear that? He's saying this is what it means to have real joy, that God gives us the ability to find joy in the mundane, that we don't need to take things to their fullest extent. You don't need to have 700 wives and 300 concubines. Maybe you do it like God said and have a wife and find your joy in giving yourself to a spouse for your entire life. You don't need to find your joy by pursuing all of the wine you can drink. Maybe you have a glass of wine and enjoy the gift of God to gladden your heart. You don't have to spend all of your money building all of the things, maybe, but maybe you invest well in what you have content with what you have in your station in life. But you can feel his frustration here. Because he's saying, how do you get to the point where you enjoy and be content in whatever circumstances you're in. Well, we have to remember, I want to point this out. I know this is a spoiler, but if you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, this is the very end of the book. Sometimes it's important to read the end before the beginning. Remember that section one is wisdom under the sun. 
That is the key phrase that happens a whole bunch in Ecclesiastes, almost nowhere else inside of Scripture. And so he's giving the wisdom of what can be contained under the sun. And this is the assessment of Koheleth's teaching. We get it at the end of chapter 12 is this third voice, this, this third party, this narrator tells us. He says, the preacher, Koheleth, sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. So he's saying these things are true. And he wanted to find things that would bring delight and joy to us. But look at verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads. All right, church, what's a goad? There's a pointy stick that you use to shove into the rear end of an ox to make it move when it's plowing your field. So the words of the wise are like goads, poking at us, prodding us, forcing us to move into places we don't want to go. And like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. He's talking about scripture. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. So as we read Ecclesiastes, this is what you need to keep in mind. The entire book of Ecclesiastes is a goad. It's pointy, it's sharp, it's painful, it's uncomfortable, and it will force us into places that we wouldn't go otherwise. But it isn't the end of everything. There's truth here, but it isn't the ultimate of all things. And here, there's something to what what is recognized in these last few verses of chapter 2, saying that God gives these things the ability to be, have satisfaction and contentment. That's what Paul says in Philippians 4, saying, I've learned the secret of contentment, whether in plenty or in want. And often it's harder to be content in plenty than in want. But it's, it's up to God to give those things, and, he has, and to the rest, he's given the business of gathering and collecting but it's just this weariness under the sun. We need to hear that rejecting God will place us squarely outside of his, of his pleasure and glory and will because we cannot live up to his perfection. We will fall short of his holiness. And what we have in Scripture only confirms that. So if you reject God or reject that there is a God, reject what Scripture has laid out for us as truth, then you've got to figure out where meaning comes from, where purpose comes from. Because Koheleth's experience and the truth that he's writing is if all we are limited to is this life under the sun, all we are limited to is what we can gain or lose, be wise or foolish with, enjoy or despair of under the sun, if that's it and then we just cease to be, then it is depressingly empty and meaningless. This entire life is a vapor, a chasing after the wind, that there are no ultimate consequences for anything you do. Whether you indulge all your desires and leave a legacy of prosperity, death awaits you. Whether you live wisely or foolishly, death comes for you. Whether you're successful and wealthy, or whether you're poor and struggling, whatever you have, you'll leave to somebody else. You can't earn your way into satisfaction and joy in the same way that you can't work your way into feeling rested. There's good news, though, that it's not as arbitrary as Koheleth thinks. It is under the sun. If your perspective is limited to your day-to-day experience of life on this planet, you can only be left in the place he is because ultimately, if you take that to its end point, it leaves you in despair. In Psalm 16, we get a little different of a take. David is writing this, and in Psalm 16, he says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Well, this is a totally different take than Koheleth, right? David is saying, my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh dwells secure. So what makes it so different for him? 
this isn't meaninglessness. But you notice there's a therefore. He says, this is be- why? Because the Lord is before me. He is my right hand. That's why I can't be shaken. David is saying that his joy and his security are a direct result of having his eyes fixed on his creator God, which is the opposite of everything that our world tells you to do right now, of looking inward to find your truth, inward to find your peace. Instead, he's saying, when I finally got my eyes off myself, and put them squarely on the one who is eternal and fixed, that is when I found joy in my heart and my whole being rejoiced. He's not looking within himself. He's not trying to follow his heart. He is looking at the transcendent hope he has in the creator God. But even still, there's a problem here because David says, your holy one you will not abandon to corruption. And every one of us, if we look at our lives, are not holy. That's why it's important that these same verses are quoted and cited by Peter in Acts chapter 2, the very first sermon that he preached after Jesus ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit had come down, and and he points out David. He says to the people gathered in Jerusalem, look at what David says. God had raised up Jesus, loosing the pangs of death, for it wasn't possible for him to be held by it. And he quotes Psalm 16, this same passage. And he goes on to say, listen, David died and was buried, but Christ could not be held. And it says in verses 31 and 32, he foresaw and spoke, David did, about the resurrection of his son, the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witness. And so, repent Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Jesus is the one who gives us the opportunity to have the fullness of joy that David talks about, that our whole beings can rejoice because we can finally get our eyes off of ourselves and fixed on him. We have the promise in Colossians 3 that if then you have been raised with Christ, if you've trusted him and been and the Spirit of God has breathed life into you, then seek the things that are above. Do you see that? Get your eyes off of the stuff here. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Why? Because you have died in your life. It with, is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the hope of the gospel that speaks into the grind of life under the sun. Don't settle for empty pleasures that you can gain now as if they're the end. Pursue what will last forever. Jesus changed everything because in him the fullness of God took on flesh. He was ultimately wise. He was sinless. And apart from him, everything is a vapor. It's, it's, what what Koheleth has written us are goads to poke at us and make us uncomfortable. But he says, look at the things that are firmly fixed nails, the collected sayings. Look to the truth of God's word, because through Jesus, we are a part of a story of redemption and restoration of all things, like we read from Isaiah today. There is no more transcendent purpose than the renewal and restoration of all things. It's so every meaning and pursuit we can, we can have under the sun, the desires of our hearts, the wisdom of our minds, the work of our hands are going to come up as a vapor, but it is only when we stop chasing the self-focused whims of our heart and turn to him who can transform our hearts that God will give you joy that will never end. It's only when you stop relying on the wisdom of your mind and the wisdom of your life to preserve your life and sustain it, realizing death can come for any one of us any moment. And we turn to the one who is wisdom, that God will give you the wisdom to see his presence and work in all things, even in the mundane. And it's only when we stop working to achieve our identity and turn to the one who's finished work for us can save us, that God will give you rest for your soul. My hope for us today is that Kohelet's words can poke at us 
so that we turn to Christ and so that we can proclaim with David, I have set the Lord always before me. He's at my right hand and I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You will make to me, known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray. Father, would you just show us clearly the emptinesses of some of the things that our hearts long for most deeply? Not that they're bad things, that you've given us good things that we can enjoy but that we're not going to enjoy them if they are our ultimate hope. Would you help us to see that real satisfaction has to come from outside of ourselves and what we can produce? Would you help us to see the ways that our own pursuits have come up empty over time and to finally get to a point of honesty like Ecclesiastes is at, to be able to say, you know what, this has come up empty. Maybe we need to try something else and we can see something that has been given to us in your word that while our glory fades away like flowers and grass, your word will stand forever. So would you move in our hearts today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.